I saw an Instagram video the other day saying that a parent should never repeat themselves more than twice. I watched it thinking, I don't know what kind of kids this parent is raising, but I know they are not human children. I'm the parent of three strong-headed young girls, and as a result, the phrase I find myself saying a lot these days is, don't make me repeat myself. It's that it's on that long list of phrases I heard from my parents and swore I'd never say. It's because I said so is another classic. But despite my exhortations, I do repeat myself quite a bit. If don't make me repeat myself is a parental mantra, it is also a mantra for the Torah. The Torah is terse, never wasting words, which makes a short phrase in this week's Parsha intriguing. We read from Parshat Shoftim, or Judges, which, as you might guess, is a, uh, uh, gives a number of laws about judges and courts and the judicial system. And in the midst is the memorable phrase, Tzedek, Tzedek, Tirdof, justice, justice shall you pursue. It's one of the most oft-quoted verses of the Torah, a short but compelling mission statement for the Jewish people. It's a powerful phrase, beautiful because of its brevity. In Hebrew, just three words, tzedek, tzedek, tirdof. And two of those words are repeated. Would tzedek, tirdof not have communicated the same thing? Perhaps the doubling of the first word serves as emphasis. Surely you shall pursue justice. But as I said before, the Torah never uses two words when one will do. And this has caused the rabbis throughout the generations to assert that this additional tzedek must have its own unique meaning. Meaning, They debate over what it might be. Rabbi Martin Buber opens his 1947 book of collected Hasidic sayings with this story. There was once a Hasidic master named Rabbi Yaakov Yitzchak of Peshishka, but his students call him Yid Hakudosh, the Holy Jew, the Holy Yid. That's a great nickname. They asked him, Master, why is the word Sedek repeated in Parshat Shoftim? Would not one have been sufficient? The Yid Hakudosh answered, We ought to follow justice with justice and not unrighteousness. That means that the use of unrighteousness as a means to righteousness, to righteous ends, makes the end itself unrighteous. Injustice as a means to injustice renders the justice unjust. Unlike the Torah, the Yid HaKudosh was not known for his brevity. But his student, who later became the head rabbi of Peshishka, Rabbi Simcha Bunim, sums it up this way. With justice shall you pursue justice. Even the pursuit of justice must employ only just means. For the Hasidic masters of Peshishka, Tzedek is repeated in our verse to teach us that it is not only just ends that we must pursue, we must also ensure we use just means. Our Parsha paints a picture of a society built on just ends, fair courts and unbiased opinions. But how does one pursue just means? It's interesting to me that Rabbi Buber, one of the greatest Jewish philosophers of the 20th century, opens his book with this question, because it is a question that plagued him throughout his life. Buber was born in Austria in 1878 and was raised in an Orthodox household. He left his traditional upbringing and studied secular philosophy of Kant and Kierkegaard and Nietzsche in Vienna. In 1889, he became a Zionist, attending congregances and helping to organize for the cause. In 1930, he moved to Germany to become a professor at the University of Frankfurt, but he resigned his position three years later when Hitler came to power. He fled Germany in 1938 and moved to pre-state Palestine, where he settled in Jerusalem and received a professorship at Hebrew University. Just a few months after Buber left Europe on November 9, 1938, was Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, where Nazi thugs destroyed Jewish-owned businesses, synagogues, and homes all over Germany. Sometime shortly thereafter, an article was published by another great thinker of the age, Mahatma Gandhi. Gandhi had decided, I think unsolicited, to weigh in on how the Jews might best resist the Nazi regime. Essentially, 
Um, Gandhi is asking the question of the Hasidic rabbis, what are just means that Jews should use to pursue just ends in Germany? Gandhi writes that the Jews should employ the same method which he advocated for his Indian brethren, the path of nonviolent resistance. He empathizes with the Jews and their plight under the Nazi regime, and he mentions his own friends in the Jewish community from his time in South Africa. He acknowledges the depth of anti-Semitism in European history, but still he says that a nonviolent path has worked for him and will work for the Jews. He encourages satyagraha, or soul force, acts of dignity so powerful that they will melt the hearts of your oppressors and sway them to your side. Gandhi writes, let the Jews who claim to be the chosen race prove their title by choosing the way of nonviolence for vindicating their position on earth. Essentially, Gandhi's argument is that nonviolence is the only just ends to achieve just means. Buber got his hands on Gandhi's letter and he was having none of it. He published a forceful open letter rebuking and refuting Gandhi's assertions. Buber is perhaps most famous for his philosophy of I-thou, the idea that through dialectical conversation we can achieve human relationships that transcend to the level of the divine. But Buber's open letter to Gandhi can basically be summed, as, summed up as, I think thou should keep thou's thoughts to thyself. Buber writes, in five years I myself spent under the present regime, I observed many instances of genuine satyagraha uh, satyagraha among the Jews, instances showing a strength of spirit. Such actions, however, exerted apparently not the slightest influence on their opponents. All honors and deeds to those who displayed such strength of soul. He asserts that the effectiveness of pacifism would be limited by the violence of the Nazi regime. Do you think, perhaps, he asked, that a Jew in Germany could pronounce in public one single sentence of a speech such as yours without being knocked down? As I read these letters this week, I couldn't help but think of the video that it's making its rounds on the social internet of a prominent ex-US general speaking at an evangelical conference who's remark who remarks that he was surprised that the Jews of Europe so willingly submitted to Nazi extermination. Why, he wonders, did they not fight back? He ignores, of course, the many instances of Jewish resistance, and he ignores the systematic deception, dehumanization, intimidation, starvation that the Nazis deployed to keep the Jews from being able to rise up. This is a form of Holocaust denial, and it should be called out and condemned. But it is also interesting in light of Gandhi's letter at the time, such as the way of our critics. In the face of annihilation, we are too passive for some, too active for others. But back to Buber. Even in his letter back to Gandhi, emphatic as it may be, Buber is wrestling with his own sense of what constitutes just means. One of Gandhi's other criticisms had been for the Zionist project in what was then Palestine. He did not view that as a solution either, encouraging European Jews to stay in Europe and criticizing violence between Jews and Arabs in Palestine. And in his response, Buber also condemns that violence. He speaks of the two um, different but legitimate claims to the land. He calls for a genuine peace where Jews and Arabs together would develop the land without one imposing its will on the other. He recognizes that this is hard, but insists that it's not impossible. He writes, we were and still are well aware that this unusual, yes, unprecedented case is a question of seeking new ways of understanding and cordial agreement between the nations. In, in one letter, he calls for nonviolence and rejects it. He wrestles with how different contexts require different means to achieve justice. He engages with another great mind through letters sent across thousands of miles, all to determine the best, most just course of action. In these words, I see a man struggling with the demands of justice, especially in unprecedented times. It's perhaps easy for Rabbi Simcha Bunim to say, tzedek, tzedek, tirdof means just ends achieved by just means, but it's a lot harder to figure out what that means, especially when the danger is closing in. 
And in reading these words this week, I thought of all the struggles of justice in our own day. I thought of the crisis in Israel where fringe voices in the Knesset are seeking to subvert democracy and impose their will upon the majority of the nation. And the ongoing crisis between Israelis and Palestinians, which has only gotten more entrenched and more complex since Buber's time. All of this demands justice. And I thought of our challenges here at home, the threats to democracy, the ongoing dialogue about accountability and responsibility for political figures. What are the demands of justice here? How are they tempered by the context of who holds power and who is oppressed? I think of the fires in Hawaii and the unequal burden of climate change. This too demands justice. And it is true not just on a national level, but on a personal one. We have entered into this season of Elul, our time to prepare for the High Holy Days. We think of the ways we have been wronged and the ways we have wronged others. How will we achieve justice in our relationships? What are the just means and the just ends that we will pursue between now and the days of awe? The goal is clear, but the path to get there is not. Returning to Buber's letter to Gandhi, I think he models a path forward through these murky waters. Buber's philosophy of I and thou is all about dialogue. It's all about encountering the other. He may reject Gandhi's assertions, but he's willing to engage with them, engage with him around them. He wants to be in dialogue with this man, this stranger who is also his peer. In his letter, he is even arguing with himself, trying to find meaning in two contradictory ideas, the dream of peaceful resistance and its apparent limitations. For, uh, for Buber, we find God in the dialogue when we elevate from the it to the thou, and he models that dialogue in his letter. Perhaps this is why tzedek is repeated twice, to remind us that we cannot achieve justice alone. Justice is only found in the dialogue between opposing ideals, between the powerful and the powerless, between the privileged and the oppressed, between the perpetrator and the victim. A justice pursued in a vacuum is not justice at all. We must bring others along. We must engage with their views, especially when they differ from our own. In this season of return, when we examine our own souls to understand the harm we have caused and the harm that has been done to us, may we find justice and work and comfort in the faces of others. May we find partners and allies in the hard work, the heart work of teshuva, repentance. As we face the challenges of our world, may we be inspired to pursue dialogical justice, a justice of diverse voices, of common good, shared commitments. And in this way, may we find blessing in our pursuit. Shabbat Shalom.